Good morning, Salt Lake City Fire Department. This is Captain Bob Silverthorne, Station 3, A Platoon. It's currently May 31st, 2018, and my portion of the Fit to Respond, Fit to Retire program will be going over firefighter cancer prevention and awareness. It's actually really fitting that I'm doing this right now. I'm coming up on 10 years anniversary of my diagnosis from Hodgkin's lymphoma. So 10 year celebration of being a survivor and hopefully the intent of this is to pass on some lessons I have learned in the past 10 years of being a cancer survivor as well as a firefighter with Salt Lake City Fire Department. So thanks for watching. So the objective of this PowerPoint is for firefighters to have a new awareness of the occupational risk factors associated with firefighting and cancer. You'll also be able to immediately take some steps necessary to minimize the threat of cancer through daily behavioral changes and implement a prevention strategy. So implement a strategy by which to try to minimize the threat of cancer. So this portion actually fits into our holistic approach to health and wellness with the strong pillars of mental health, fitness, and nutrition, as well as providing a good defense against cancer. So if we can minimize our occupational risk, we, do, we can to some extent sort of defend against the dangers associated with our job and remain working and on the workforce. We can also take some steps necessary to minimize the threat of developing cancer after we leave the fire department. Also, this will hopefully lead to less time off the job to go through cancer treatment as well as live a happy, healthy life in retirement. So it's not just a matter of trying to minimize the threat while we're working so we can stay working, but also to enjoy our retirement years after we leave the fire department. So this slide, I'm talking about a couple studies that were conducted that came across some pretty interesting findings. Uh, one of which says that firefighters are twice, like, twice as likely as a general population to develop testicular cancer. We also face a 50% greater chance of contracting multiple myeloma, which is a deadly cancer that attacks bone marrow, as well as non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Firefighters are 40% more likely to develop skin cancer and 30% more likely to develop malignant melanoma, prostate, brain, and rectal cancer. A 2001 study, uh, partially funded by the IFF in Philadelphia, reached some of the same conclusions of the Lee Masters research. It also found that firefighters are greater risk compared to the general population of getting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and melanoma. So it just kind of further confirmed the findings of a prior study. Cell division is essential for healthy growth of an organism. Complex genetic mechanisms have evolved to switch cell division on and off at the proper time for normal development. Now let's take a closer look at the three main types of carcinogens that cause cancer. Chemicals. Today, several million chemicals exist, and approximately 70,000 chemicals are regularly used in business and industry. It is not known how many of these chemicals used in industry are carcinogenic because not all have been tested. Additionally, these chemicals are part of the synthetic materials that make up the everyday products in our lives. During a fire, these synthetic materials break down, releasing the chemicals as products of combustion. Viruses. Certain viruses have been shown to be associated with specific cancers. Chronic infection with hepatitis B and C viruses can cause liver cancer in humans. The human papillomavirus, HPV, can cause cervical cancer and head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Radiation. 
Radiation is a hazardous form of energy that can severely damage cells and tissues. Ionizing radiation, the most dangerous form of radiation, is produced naturally through the decay of unstable radioactive elements, such as uranium. Firefighters may encounter ionizing radiation when responding to emergencies at medical offices, hospitals, industry, and scientific research laboratories. Note also that X-ray machines and other devices artificially produce radiation. Now let's cover carcinogens that present a danger to firefighters. Firefighters have substantial exposure to carcinogens due to the nature of their work environment. Firefighters have a 27.3% risk of cancer death compared to 24% for the male U.S. population. This represents a 13.8% increase in the risk of cancer death. Almost every other workforce in the U.S. has established occupational controls in the last 40 years to reduce carcinogen exposure. For example, when asbestos is uncovered, there are regulations and safe practices enforced. Additionally, there are set industrial exposure limits to chemicals and physical agents that are the legal limits for exposure of an employee to a chemical substance or physical agent over time. In direct contrast to that, firefighters continue to be exposed to high levels of carcinogens in smoke and soot because fire suppression occurs in uncontrolled hazardous environments. There are three key studies that provide a scientific basis regarding increased cancer risk directly affecting the occupation of firefighting. Although there are some differences, all three identified a statistically significant increased risk of some cancers for firefighters. The three studies are the NIOSH study, the Nordic study, and the Lemasters meta-analysis. IARC is a component of the World Health Organization and is considered the authoritative agency on cancer causation. IARC evaluates data from animal and human epidemiological studies for chemicals, manufacturing processes, and occupations for carcinogenic potential. They then classify them into categories based on the quality and quantity of data. We'll cover the IARC categories next slide. First define IARC Group 1 and IARC Group 2A agents. IARC Group 1 agents. This category is used when there is sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity in humans. IARC Group 2A agents. This category is used when there is limited evidence of carcinogenicity in humans and sufficient evidence of carcinogenicity in experimental animals. Group 2A is known as probably carcinogenic to humans. There are 117 IR Group 1 agents known as of 2015, and these are the 10 that firefighters are most commonly exposed to. IR Group 2A agents include the following. Note, the attachments with Module 2 show IR Group 1 and Group 2A carcinogens common in the fire environment. The smoke, suit, and other products of combustion that contain many group 1 and 2A carcinogens are probably responsible for the increased rate of cancer that studies have found in firefighters. This list shows the common carcinogens in the fire environment. Hepatitis B and C are mainly found in emergency medical care. This is not a comprehensive list as there are many group 1 and 2A chemicals that firefighters may be exposed to while extinguishing fires. Additionally, there are many Group 2B possibly carcinogenic chemicals that firefighters are exposed to. The UL studies showed that more than 99% of smoke particles collected during overhaul were less than 1 micron in diameter. Let's put this in perspective by comparison to sand, human hair, and other airborne particles. In the example, the micron unit of measure is represented by the Greek lowercase letter symbol UM. Beach sand is 90 microns in diameter. Human hair is 50 to 70 microns in diameter. Combustion particles are less than 2.5 microns. And dust, pollen, etc. less than 10 microns. 
This comparison demonstrates the significance of the UL study revealing smoke particles of less than one micron in diameter. Of these, more than 97% were too small to be visible by the naked eye, that is, particles less than 0.1 micron, suggesting that clean air was not really that clean. Studies indicate that one in three firefighters will be diagnosed with cancer. So it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So if you look around your workforce, your division, or your company, if you look around, one in three of us will be diagnosed with cancer. And of those, we have a 13.8% of increased chance of death caused by cancer. And there's three studies that kind of prove this. One was a NIOSH study in 2013, talked about uh, firefighters from San Francisco, Chicago, and Philadelphia. Second was a Nordic firefighter study, and lastly was a, another Lee Masters study, which was kind of cool. It com combined data from 32 smaller studies of 20 different types of cancer, and it did identify 10 cancers that firefighters have a, an increased risk of developing. Those are testicular, multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, skin melanoma, brain, rectum, prostate, stomach, and colon cancer. All pretty nasty, nasty cancer diagnoses. So there are several factors that can contribute to getting cancer, and I like to call it feeding cancer, or things that cancer loves. So a lot of the most recent studies talk about um, external exposure. So 90% of exposure has to do with skin absorption and 10% is internal exposure, so inhalation. So what this means to me, uh, and kind of displays to me, is that 10% is coming through our lungs, which sounds like we're doing pretty good with protecting our lungs by wearing SCBAs. What we're doing really poorly at is the skin absorption piece, so not properly deconning our PPE, not properly deconning our skin, and allowing those carcinogens to get trans transmitted transdermally, okay? 99% of smoke particles were smaller than one micron. So if a hair is 10 microns, you can kind of see how small the one micron of a smoke particle is. So even though you can't see it, which smaller than one micron you won't be able to see, um, it's still out there and still a looming threat. There are three main carcinogens that we're exposed to just by nature of the job, chemicals, radiation, and viruses. But there is something we can do. There's a health and wellness piece. So a fit lifestyle to reduce our risk. That has to do with a complete package of what we can do to minimize. And one of the things that we can do is recover correctly through sleep. And recently the World Health Organization has listed sleep deprivation, which is us with our shift work, that's a probable carcinogen stated by the World Health Organization. In addition to that, alcohol and nicotine can increase the likelihood of getting cancer. Why is that? Well, I think it's anything that you can do to suppress your immune system is what cancer loves. So whether it be sleep deprivation, alcohol, nicotine, stress, poor diet, lack of exercise, sedentary lifestyle, any of those things you have to think of. If cancer loves it, let's try to get rid of it or minimize it. Also, as I stated, stress increases inflammation and reduces immunity. So a few years back, we were able to pass the House Bill 135, which was the first cancer presumptive for firefighters, which was a huge victory and hopefully led the way for more cancers being covered under presumptive legislation. But initially, we were able to pass four different cancers, one being the pharynx, second is the esophageal cancer, third being lung, and then mesothelioma. However, uh, the firefighter who contracts a presumptive cancer must meet some further requirements. One being that has, you have to go undergo a physical examination, which 
in our fire department we do, so that wouldn't be too hard to prove. Also, you have to be employed as a firefighter for eight years or more and regularly respond to firefighting or emergency calls within that eight-year period. And lastly, you must provide documentation from a physician that indicates that you have not used tobacco for eight years preceding reporting the presumptive cancer to the employer or division. So you still have some work ahead of you if you do get any of these uh, presumptive cancers to prove or to be covered. But it's a step in the right direction. So there are a few things that we can do to get the message out as a fire department to consider or uh, to help prevent cancer. So cancer risk education, we need to constantly get the message out of what we can do as firefighters to minimize our cancer risk and just keep pushing that out. And hopefully eventually it'll be cultural for us to just constantly be on the defense against cancer. There's also different programs through our employee assistance program to uh, try to stop smoking or have a healthier lifestyle. I just found out the other day that there's even a sleep coach that can help you get better sleep when you're on your four days recovering. Presumptive cancer support, any sort of support we can get up on the hill to help push through cancer legislation to become law would be beneficial. And the hope is that every cancer that firefighters get diagnosed with is covered under presumptive cancer legislation. Also I stated, also I stated get your annual cancer screening. This would be through your own physician. We annually get a free physical, so I would include cancer screening in that physical. Another thing we could do is exposure reporting. This may be a challenge. Um, our infers may not capture all exposures which requires, requires captains to be aware and proactive. So that would mean documenting through our certain forms and fire home or keeping a log individually of calls we go on and are exposed to certain carcinogens. And then lastly, to promote health and wellness on the fire department. It's a huge piece. So these are some personal considerations as far as cancer prevention goes. Just some things that I've learned uh, throughout the last 10 years, just kind of some heads up stuff. So you want to shower or steam after every call. If you have a steamer or a sauna or even a hot shower, get in there after every fire and open up those pores so you can purge the toxins, right? Like I stated earlier, a lot of this exposure is transdermal. So as soon as we get those carcinogens out of our skin and off our pores, the better we are. We currently are in the process of installing a couple of detox saunas at the new fire stations. One is currently, station 14 is currently in service with a couple detox saunas. So these aren't relaxation saunas like you would normally see, in it, see at your health club or even some of our fire stations, but this is specifically for detoxification. There's a bike in there and infrared heat and then intent is to open up those pores and get some of those toxins out. Another thing I like to talk about is blow by return to quarters. So if a lot of fire departments don't have a good smoke evacuation system in their bay, or maybe they have these new devices on their rig, like the no smoke that kind of burn the particulate. But quite honestly, I think that gives the firefighter the, the illusion of protection. So as a company officer, I, I decided that when we return to quarters, we would open both front and back bay doors. Then we would pull the engine or the truck in. You would turn off the rig, wait 10, 15 seconds, allow those diesel fumes to kind of purge through the bay. And then you would go ahead and close the doors and exit the rig. So we talk about a hot wash on the fire department. That term is used uh, typically as a term for debriefing after calls just to rally it around the tailboard and just kind of do a, a quick debrief of the calls. Some things that were good, some things that were bad, lesson learned, but this is actually also a good opportunity to actually pull out the booster and do a scene hasty decon before you leave. 
But not only that, but when you uh, take off your still contaminated PPE, I would encourage everyone to put in a separate area from the cab so you're not just taking that stuff off, you know, turning on the heat inside the, the rig itself and that those carcinogens continue to off-gas and uh, exposing yourself. Lastly, uh, you want to leave the PPE in the bay. This is a no-brainer, but we still see firefighters in their turnouts in the station or having them by, by their bed like they used to do back in the day. While those fumes and uh, those carcinogens continue to fill the room and expose the sleeping firefighter. I hate to have to even say this, but we still see it once, once in a while in the fire department. Here's a few more personal considerations. You want to launder your PPE frequently, and you don't want to miss your stuff, your items such as your helmet, your Nomex hood, your Here's a few more personal considerations. You want to launder your PPE frequently, and you don't want to miss your stuff, your items such as your helmet, your Nomex hood, your internal harness, suspension, etc., in addition to your SBA mask. You want to follow the manufacturer's specifications, and then just leave it in the station. You don't want to bring your dirty PPE home and expose your family or leave contaminated PPE in your car. We have an amazing PPE program right now run with uh, Jordan Doms. He comes out, he gives you loaners. He is highly qualified to launder and decontaminate PPE and gets it back to you in a relatively timely manner. So there's really no excuse anymore to have contaminated PPE. Basically fill out the form. He comes in on your four day and swaps you out. He gets you cleaned up. Uh, also on the fire ground, we see safety officers as well as investigators were in the forward gas monitor which is a good indication of some of the uh, potential dangers with forward gases but it really is no indication of the threat of carcinogens on the fire scene so even though the safety officer may say it's okay for these forward gases that you're not working in an IDLH environment you're still in a hot zone, a contaminated zone. So continue to wear your mask from entry through overhaul. Like I said, transdermal exposure risk is huge. We have hero wipes on the rig now. So you want to make sure you use them. Decon your face, neck, hands, radio, and lapel mic. Lastly, I talk about, uh, this is maybe pie in the sky sort of scenario, but we have an opportunity to get a mass box spectrometer on large fires. This is something that would be requested through our hazmat team that you set up on fires that uh, detects the different hazards that are on the fire ground and what our fires are emitting in terms of gases. Continuing with some other things that we can do, I talk about uh, what I would call squashing the side job if you can. You know, these four days are built in not for us to go out and put roofs on or do plumbing. And I'll admit I've been the side job guy from time to time, and I get it. But what I've come to learn over my years on the fire department is those four days are built in there for you to get back to combat readiness and allow your body to recover properly through sleep and uh, de-stressing and things of that nature. Remember, cancer loves firefighter fatigue and a taxed immune system. So quit that side job. We get paid pretty decent and uh, recover appropriately. And your family lo loves you home as well. As far as nutrition goes, you want to eat the best you can. The paleo model is beneficial. You want to eat a lot of veggies. Try to stay away from processed food and sugar. If you uh, could just do those two things, just stay away from processed food and sugar, you're going to be way ahead of the game. Because cancer loves that stuff. And uh, as a rule of thumb, you want to shop on the outside walls of the grocery store. Typically, that's where your less processed food is. So lots of veggies, some meat, things of that nature. You want to create balance in your life. You want to educate, excuse me, exercise, hydrate. You want to eat well, sleep, pray, meditate, things of that nature. Also, you want to get your annual physicals, including cancer screening. 
Everyone's a safety officer, right? You want to keep an eye on your crews and your fire family. If you see something, don't be afraid to uh, speak up. You know, don't be passive. You see something that should happen. If you see your firefighter buddy that your turnouts are kind of dirty, just say something. You don't have to be a jerk about it, but you know, you're not doing me or anyone else any favors if you're allowing us to uh, do things that are, aren't safe and aren't uh, good practices on the fire ground. This is uh, some other risk reduction things that came out through uh, firefighter cancer support, just sort of reiterate some of the things I spoke about. But uh, in addition, you want to decon the fire engine as well, the interior of it, to try to keep any of those carcin engines out, as well as uh, you want to use sunscreen or sunblock in your daily activities of uh, being on the job. But most of the stuff I already covered in the prior slide, so check them out. So in conclusion, hopefully we as firefighters can maintain a defensive posture and take steps necessary to minimize the risk of getting cancer. I understand that there's a, you know, there's some risks that simply come with the job, but that being said, there, there are several things that we can do as heads up firefighters to defend against uh, a cancer diagnosis. So too many of us have fallen victim to cancer and have had to endure vicious cancer treatments and have had to face their own mortality. And some have even lost the battle, unfortunately. But the purpose of this message is to do all we can to prevent this disease so we can own, we can live a happy and healthy life both on and off the job, not just for ourselves but for our family, friends, and coworkers who deserve it. So let's get out there and do our best to stay, stay in the game and keep an eye on ourselves. And... Uh, Thanks for watching. This is Captain Silverthorne out.